Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be continuing our conversation about the immune system by focusing on innate immunity. If you recall from one of our previous videos, we talked about how the first two lines of defense are part of the innate immune system. So anything that gets into our body is going to have to go through at least the first line of defense, which are the barriers that are put in place. We're also going to talk today about how the cells of the innate immune system go into action in order to help fend off pathogens when they enter our body. So stay tuned while we continue our conversation with our third video in our set about the immune system. Hi, and welcome back to our conversation on the immune system. Today, we're going to be talking specifically about our innate immune system. If you remember from one of our videos uh, prior that we talked about the three lines of defense, and if you recall, the first two lines of defense are part of our innate immune system. So any pathogen that makes it into our body, if it's going to cause an infection, is going to have to breach the first line of defense. It's going to have to get past some of our barriers, whether it's getting into the respiratory tract and making it through the, past the mucus and the mucosilia escalator, or perhaps it's breaching the skin barrier. Either way, in order for a pathogen to make it into our body and cause an infection, it's going to have to make it past one of those or one or more of those barriers in order to get into our tissues. From the perspective of the pathogen, we refer to this as its portal of entry. All pathogens have some uh, characteristic portal of entry that allows them to make it into our body and get into our tissues. Once that pathogen has made it into our tissues, it's now time for the second line of defense to take action. If you recall, the second line of defense is going to include responses like phagocytosis. It's also going to include fever and inflammation and a bunch of antimicrobial proteins. Now, the important thing to remember is that there are lots of different ways our body can recognize that it's been infected by something, that there's an invasion going on. What I'm going to talk about today are several different aspects of the innate immune system. Now, the order in which I talk about them is not necessarily the order in which they would actually occur in all cases, but in some cases they do occur this way. In fact, I would argue that perhaps in most cases, this is the pathway that it would be utilized to recognize an incoming infection. So I'm going to start first with a group of antimicrobial proteins called complement. So complement is a collection of several different proteins that are produced predominantly by the liver, but they're found throughout our entire body. They're found in high abundance in both our bloodstream and in our tissues. And complement proteins are very interesting. There's a whole host of them, and they actually become activated in a process called a cascade reaction. When we look at a cascade reaction, what actually happens is uh, either one or a handful of proteins become activated. Once they become activated, they go on to activate several other proteins, and those proteins then go on to activate still other proteins until we get some sort of, uh, some sort of cascade uh, reaction occurring where we get a final result. This happens, for example, with blood clotting factors, but when we talk about, when we talk about complement, it's actually going to be involving a bunch of proteins whose names are shortened to begin with a C. So one of the most abundant complement proteins in our tissues in our bloodstream is a protein called C3 or complement 3. And complement 3 gets activated more or less spontaneously, and it's activated by being clipped. So you can almost think of uh, the complement protein being translated with a protective cap on it. But once that cap gets, gets clipped off, now that complement protein is active. And it turns out that complement proteins, or C3 proteins, get activated pretty much constantly, and they're found, activated C3 is found in high abundance throughout our tissues. What's neat about C3 is C3 is a very promiscuous protein. What that means is it will bond to pretty, bind to the surface of pretty much anything in our tissues. And what's neat is if C3, activated C3, binds to the surface of an invading pathogen, say a bacterium or an enveloped virus, what it can do then is attach itself to that particular pathogen, and then it begins to recruit other complement proteins to begin the cascade reaction. So C3 spontaneously gets activated via clipping. Now the activated C3 binds to the surface of, let's just say it's a bacterium for this particular example. Now C3 is able to recruit and interact with another complement protein, C5. It activates C5 by clipping its end off and activating C5. Now activated C5 can go on to recruit other complement proteins, C6, C7, C8, and C9, and activates all of them through clipping. And what's really interesting is if all of these cascade, if all these proteins get together on the surface of a bacterial cell or any other type of cell, they can form something called a membrane attack complex or a MAC. MACs are pretty cool because these, these complexes, these proteinaceous complexes actually punch holes and disrupt the selective permeability of cell membranes. 
And if enough of these MACs form on the surface of a bacterium or even a eukaryotic cell, they can destroy the selective permeability of that particular cell and, and essentially kill it. And what's neat about this is this co these complement proteins uh, can do all of this work without the involvement of a single cell. And the thing you have to realize is there is so much complement in your activated in your tissues at all times that pretty much anything that enters into your body is going to get labeled by complement. Now you may be wondering, hey, if complement is so promiscuous and combined to pretty much anything, doesn't it also bind to our cells? Truth of the matter is, it does. The good news is, is your cells have several different mechanisms to make complement go away. So if a C3, an activated C3 protein lands on the surface of your cells, your cells can inactivate it so it doesn't destroy it. The bad news for pathogens is they don't have those proteins that can inactivate complement, and therefore they're going to be targeted almost immediately upon entering the tissue or the bloodstream by these complement proteins. Now, complement is very important, and it's not just because it can be forming these me membrane attack complexes and destroying bacteria and other cells all on their own. There are other aspects to complement's behavior that can help to alert other aspects of the immune system or help the other aspects of your native immune system uh, better fight off pathogens. One of the things that happens when complement binds to the surface of a pathogen is it actually labels that thing for destruction. In a sense, it functions like a poor man's antibody. So by having complement on the outside, two things are true. First off, the presence of complement on the outside can actually act as a marker for some of your innate immune cells that whatever this thing is shouldn't be there. It marks it as non-self. But furthermore, by, by being on the surface, it can actually make it easier for your innate immune cells to phagocytose these. See, your innate immune cells, things like macrophages and neutrophils, have a specialized receptor on the surface of their cells that can actually bind to complement, and they actually make it much easier for that particular phagocyte to ingest the microbe that's been labeled with complement. This is called opsonization. So the labeling of, of pathogens with complement or when we talk about it in the future, antibodies is referred to as opsonization. And your innate immune cells have specialized receptors that can interact both with complement and antibodies that make it more easily to recognize that something is a pathogen and to eat it. Remember, we talked about certain bacteria, for example, have these capsules or slime layers on the outside that can make them very hard to digest. Well, these bacteria get a lot easier to chew up if they have complement opsonized on the outside of them. They get even easier if there's antibodies on the outside, but we're not there yet. That's part of the adaptive immune system. The other neat thing is this. Remember how we talked about complement gets activated by being clipped. You clip a little piece of that protein off to activate it. Well, those little pieces that get clipped off that aren't part of the active version of the complement are actually quite important because they can act as chemoattractant cytokines, also known as chemokines. And when, when activated complement begins to accumulate in a tissue, and these little spare ends that get broken off prior to the active or during the activation step begin to accumulate in the tissue, they actually act as a signal for nearby innate immune cells to come rushing towards the battle scene. It's an indication if that much complement is being activated and utilized that there's something going on and they better go investigate. So in a sense, complement does three majorly important things very, very early on in an invasion to help get the innate immune system activated. First off, it can form the membrane attack complexes. These alone, if present in sufficient quantities, can actually destroy uh, microbes on their own. Next, by, by being activated by clipping, they can then recruit innate immune cells to the scene, act as chemokines to recruit innate immune cells to the scene of the battle to help them aid in the fight. And thirdly, by opsonizing the outside of those microbes or whatever the pathogen happens to be, they can actually make it much easier for those innate immune cells to come along and phagocytose or otherwise destroy whatever the pathogen happens to be. So let's say for the sake of argument that complement isn't going to solve all of our problems. We know that happens to be the case, right? Because we've got all of these other aspects of the innate immune system that are going to get involved. So what else immediately in the tissue is actually able to help us when we have some type of invading pathogen? Again, let's just say that it's a bacterium. Well, we have two different sentinel cells that are roaming around in our tissues. These are the macrophages and the dendritic cells. Now remember, macrophages and dendritic cells begin in circulation as monocytes, and then once those monocytes make it into the tissue, they are then able to differentiate into either a macrophage or a dendritic cell. Both of those cells, cell types, are wandering around in our tissues, sort of on patrol. So let's start by talking about macrophages. Macrophages are sort of a jack of all trades, and they're one of the most important cells in our innate immune system. During, a, they have three levels of activation. It's called resting, activated, and hyperactivated. 
During the resting state, a macrophage functions mainly as a garbage collector. It roams around the tissues, collecting the debris from dead or dying cells, ingesting them, breaking them down, and sort of removing them from the tissue so they don't clutter up the tissues and keep them nice and clean. But on the surface of all macrophages, you're going to find a collection of receptors called PRRs, or pathogen recognition receptors. See, while they're out there collecting, collecting garbage and, and digesting cellular debris and so on and so forth, they're also on the lookout. They're looking for things that don't belong inside of our tissue, things that aren't self, things that are from the outside. And that's what pathogen recognition receptors help them do. Pathogen recognition receptors are able to interact with broad classes of, of foreign material that we refer to collectively as PAMPs, or pathogen-associated molecular patterns. These are chemicals that our body doesn't normally produce, so things like lipopolysaccharide and peptidoglycan. Now, what can happen then is a macrophage can be activated or move into the activated or hyperactivated state when it begins to encounter signs that an invasion has occurred. Those signs can be both endogenous or exogenous. Endogenous refers to materials that are produced by our body. A great example of an endogenous mechanism for activating macrophages is those little broken off pieces of complement that we talked about that act as chemokines. But it could also be other types of cytokines, things like interferon gamma uh, or, or, or interleukins, that might be a sign that some of our other innate immune cells are engaged in a battle with something. So if one of our macrophages detects one of these endogenous signals, it will immediately go from resting and jump into an activated state. Now, in an activated state, a, macrophages, a macrophage ceases doing its job as a garbage collector, and it actually begins sampling the environment more aggressively, taking larger gulps of the fluid around it, so it can begin trying to detect what that particular pathogen might be. It's actually going to follow that chemical trail of breadcrumbs to whatever the battle scene is. This is called chemotaxis, or movement in response to a chemical signal. Now, this is an activated macrophage, and an macro activated macrophage is also very good at doing something called antigen presentation. We're not ready to talk about antigen presentation just yet, but I want you to keep it in the back of your mind that a macrophage, particularly an activated macrophage, is very good at doing antigen presentation. Just hold that thought for a couple more videos and we'll get back to it. But a macrophage can also be pushed into a hyperactivated state. That hyperactivated state typically requires the PRRs on the outside of that particular cell to be engaged by the presence of some type of exogenous or foreign material. So let's say that that macrophage, that activated macrophage, follows that breadcrumb of chemokines to the scene of the battle, and then all of a sudden it starts to pick up on some of that battlefield material. It starts to detect PAMPs, or direct evidence that there is something pathogenic or foreign in the tissue. All of a sudden, that macrophage is tripped into the hyperactivated state. And in the hyperactivated state, it becomes essentially a killing machine. It physically grows in size. It ceases its job of, of being an antigen presenting cell and turns into just a massive eater. It grows in size so that it can ingest larger microbes. It begins to upregulate the production of lysosomes because it's going to begin eating way more cells. So it's going to need way more of those cellular stomachs to help break down everything that it's phagocytosing. It also upregulates the production of chemical weaponry, such as hydrogen peroxide. And in fact, some cases, uh, macrophages have been known to actually essentially create lysosomes packed with hydrogen peroxide and then dump them outside of the cell to bombard large multicellular parasites uh, with hydrogen peroxide in an attempt to, to damage those to the point of killing them. So macrophages are, um, hyperactivated macrophages are amazing killing machines. The other thing that hyperactivated macrophages are very good at doing is releasing inflammatory cytokines. So we're now very early on in the infection. We have complement sort of doing its thing, recruiting some of the immune cells, but the macrophage is now on location in its hyperactivated state, and it's going to begin secreting inflammatory cytokines and other chemokines to trigger the inflammatory response, which is going to be very important, in just a minute, but it's also going to start activating other nearby innate immune cells. One of the other innate immune cells that might be present in the tissue that can come to the immediate aid are the dendritic cells. Now, of course, macrophages would also like to recruit uh, other cells as well, so there will be other macrophages around it that could be activated by those endogenous signals being released by that macrophage. And the other thing that's going to happen is the macrophage is going to seek to recruit cells from the bloodstream. We'll get to that in just a minute. First, let's talk about dendritic cells. So dendritic cells are the other tissue sentinels. Remember, these are these cells that have sort of a dendritic-like appearance. Uh, they're multi-lobed, and they sort of crawl around just below the tissue. 
Their job is to sort of survey, uh, to surveil the tissue. Uh, they're coded again in PRRs so that they're able to detect invaders. They don't have three levels of activation. They're either resting, which is them sort of sampling the environment, looking for invaders, or they are activated. They could be activated, for example, by some of these chemokines that that macrophage is now secreting. They could also be activated, just like macrophages, by having one of their, their pathogen recognition receptors binding some type of exogenous evidence of an infection, uh, something like something that we refer to collectively as PAMPs, those pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Again, things like lipopolysaccharide or peptidoglycan uh, or viral DNA or viral RNA, basically things that our body doesn't produce. Hyperactivated macrophage, I'm sorry, activated dendritic cells will then migrate via chemotaxis to the scene of the battle by following, again, those chemical bread breadcrumbs in the form of chemokines. Once it gets to the battle scene, though, it's not going to do what the macrophage does. It is a phagocyte, but it is not going to be tasked with eating whole other cells. Instead, the dendritic cell's job is to collect as much of the material, as much of the debris from the battle scene as it possibly can. It's going to go around for about six hours, grabbing as much of the material uh, from that battlefield as it can, because the job of the dendritic cell is not to really get involved in the fight, but it's to collect as much evidence as possible. Remember, our dendritic cell is very analogous to a photojournalist. It's not going to get involved in the battle itself. It wants to take pictures. It wants to do reconnaissance so that it can inform the big guns of the adaptive immune system of what's going on. Now, macrophages and dendritic cells are nice, but we're going to need to really hire some of our professional killing cells and get them into the tissue if we really want to have a chance of the innate immune system winning this battle. The cells that we need to get to, though, aren't in the tissue. They're going to be in the bloodstream. The cells that we want to bring into the bloodstream are, are bring in from the bloodstream are going to be your neutrophils and your natural killer cells. So how is this going to happen? Well, this is going to happen through the activity of those inflammatory cytokines that were, are being released by both dendritic cells and hyperactivated macrophages at this point. This is going to trigger localized inflammation. What ends up happening is these inflammatory cytokines are able to interact with the endothelial cells that make up the nearby blood vessels. And this is going to cause them to change what they do. They're going to undergo a process called vasodilation. In other words, the blood vessels are going to dilate, the cells are going to stretch apart, and those blood vessels are going to become somewhat leaky. They're also going to begin changing what proteins they produce on the inside of the blood vessel because these are going to act as red flags or exit ramps to help recruit the neutrophils and the natural killer cells from the bloodstream specifically into those tissues that are inflamed where the infection is going on. So remember that we have about 20 billion neutrophils circulating in our, in our body at any given time. How do they know how to exit the blood vessels? Remember, they're zipping along through our blood vessels at a pretty quick pace. So how do we get them to notice that there is an off-ramp coming up and how do we get them off of that off-ramp and into the tissues where we need them? Well, one of the things that's going to happen is those endothelial cells, upon receiving those inflammatory cytokines, are going to start producing a protein called selectin. And selectin is going to be produced, it's going to dangle out into the blood vessels, and there is a receptor on the surface of those neutrophils and natural killer, cells, natural killer cells that can interact with that selectin. Selectin causes those cells to begin slowing down, and instead of zipping through the blood vessels, they're actually going to be rolling on the surface of those blood vessels now. The next step in the process is those rolling, blood, those rolling uh, neutrophils, for example, are going to interact with another protein that's being produced on the inside of the, of the endothelial cell now called ICAM. So there is a protein on the surface of neutrophils called integrin, an integrin is able to interact with ICAM on the surface of the endothelial cells, and that causes, those, causes the neutrophils or the natural killer cells to now stop. They're now paused on the surface of those blood vessels, and what they're going to be doing is sniffing with their other receptors for some of those inflammatory cytokines and some of that battlefield material to begin leaking into the blood vessels. That is the positive sign for the neutrophil or the natural killer cell that this is a location where neutrophils are needed. It needs direct evidence that there is something going on in this particular tissue or it won't crawl through the blood vessel. What then happens is that neutrophil is actually going to flatten out and become almost an amoeboid shape and then it's going to slide between those newly stretched out blood vessel cells and enter into the tissue. This process is called diapedesis and this is how, for the most part, the, any cell that's in your blood vessel is going to be able to make it out into the tissue. This is a hugely important step because a number of cells are going to make it to the tissue via the bloodstream. Things like neutrophils and natural killer cells on the innate immune side of things, but also we're going to have helper T cells that are going to, and, natural, and uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, or otherwise known as killer T cells, trying to get into the tissue through this process too.
That's why inflammation is such an important step. It provides a way for cells to exit the blood vessels and get into the tissues where they're needed. Lack of inflammation, on the other hand, is equally as important because that means cells won't be leaving the, leaving the blood vessels at spots where there is no need for them to leave. So once neutrophils make it into the tissue, they're going to go about doing their job. Remember, neutrophils' predominant job is to kill and break stuff. They are granulocytes, and those granules are packed full of cytotoxic compounds. They're also packed full, and they're also packed full of inflammatory cytokines. So as those neutrophils, neutrophils begin to pour into the tissue in the hundreds of thousands and millions, they're going to go right to work. They're going to hop in. They're going to kill bacteria. Uh, in this particular example, any way they can. Remember, they can do it either through phagocytosis, they can do it, do it by releasing uh, harmful cytotoxic chemicals, or they can produce those nets that can sort of impair the mobility of certain, uh, of certain pathogens, which can make them either easy to digest by the neutrophil or they can be eaten by another cell like a macrophage. So neutrophils are going to jump in, kill one or two cells, die, and become pus. That's just what happens. That's the life of a neutrophil. On the other hand, natural killer cells, they're, all, they're found in the, in the bloodstream as well, but they can also be found in the spleen. When they make it to the tissues, they've got a couple, uh, they have a slightly different job. Remember that natural killer cells are not phagocytes, um, but when they get to the tissue, they're typically involved in our antiviral defense. Now, for the example we're using, this isn't a virus, right? So how can the natural killer cells help? Well, natural killer cells can actually get involved in killing other cells like bacteria and other eukaryotic pathogens uh, through the cytotoxic compounds that they release that typically induce apoptosis in our cells, but can trigger cell death in other cells as well. This is particularly helpful if those cells have already been labeled by complement. Now, the other thing that natural killer cells can do is, again, like the neutrophils, begin aiding in the inflammatory response. Remember, when neutrophils get there, they're going to secrete their inflammatory cytokines. Natural killer cells can also do the same thing. What you're seeing is by recruiting these neutrophils in natural killer cells, you're only aiding to the inflammatory response. And this inflammatory response is hugely important because it's going to continuously allow cells to make it in from the blood vessels in order to continue to aid in this fight. Natural killer cells actually have a pretty cool relationship with macrophages, and here's why. So let's say this is a case where this is a bacterial infection. Uh, there really are no viral, virally infected cells that need to be destroyed. Natural killer cells can help by simply activating macrophages. So natural killer cells are able to secrete, cy secrete cytokines, like interferon gamma, that can influence uh, macrophages. So they begin re releasing interferon gamma. This is going to be sensed by other nearby macrophages and they will go from resting into being an activated macrophage. They will begin making it to the battle scene and eventually when they get to the battle scene, their pathogen recognition receptors or PRRs are going to interact with PAMPs. This is gonna trip them into the hyperactivated state. And remember, hyperactivated macrophages are really good at secreting cytokines, things like TNF, tissue necrosis factor. Of course, this actually stimulates the, the, the natural killer cells. Now, one of the things that happens is this interaction, as the natural killer cells begin producing still more interferon and the macrophages begin producing still more TNF, they sort of do this feed forward mechanism and all of a sudden a crazy thing happens. Eventually, these cytokines produced by the macrophages begin to influence the way the natural killer cell behaves and all of a sudden they start to get a signal for proliferation. So literally, those natural killer cells, while they're doing this whole thing and releasing cytokines, they start to multiply. So now you've got even more natural killer cells in the tissue. They're secreting even more of their cytokines, which is activating even more macrophages and, and, and furthering the inflammatory response. And then those macrophages are getting hyperactivated and causing those natural killer cells to produce even more of themselves. And the next thing you know, you're sort of building this innate immune response right at the scene of the battle. And this is amazing and this is awesome because what this is is some sort of giant feed forward mechanism where the innate immune system is sort of building off of its own momentum and gaining strength as it fights the infection. But the thing to realize is this, if this is a small and localized infection, it's very likely that the innate immune system can handle this. It's something like a pimple, for example. But if this is a serious infection, the innate immune system alone is not going to be up for the task of completely removing this particular, or complete, completely removing these pathogens from the tissue, and it's going to need help. It's going to need help from the specialized adaptive immune system to come to its aid. It's going to need helper T cells. It's going to need antibodies, and if it's a viral infection, it's going to need killer T cells. The only cell involved in this conversation that can actually make that happen 
particularly if this is a novel infection, if this is the first time this particular infection has occurred in this individual, is the dendritic cell. So remember, we left the dendritic cell wandering around the battle scene. They were collecting as much of that battlefield material as they possibly could. They're going to hang out at the battle scene for about six hours. Then after six hours, they're going to hop into the nearest lymphoid lymphatic vessel, and they're going to travel to the nearest secondary lymphoid organ, most commonly going to be a lymph node. It's there inside the lymph node that they are going to encounter the cells of the adaptive immune system. And through a process called antigen presentation, which we'll talk about in our next video, dendritic cells are able to alert and inform the adaptive immune system and get them to come to the aid of the innate immune system and hopefully destroy this infection. We'll talk about that in our next video. We'll leave it there for today. Thank you so much for continuing our journey in discussing the immune system today. As I said, today was, was, we were talking about the innate immune response that happens initially after an infection occurs. We left our story off today by talking about how the dendritic cell is going to alert the adaptive immune system as to what's going on through a process called antigen presentation. In our next video, we'll talk about what antigen presentation is and how that leads to the activation of the adaptive immune system. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you're learning a lot and I'll see you guys real soon.